Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 19th of July, 2020, and it's also my birthday, so happy birthday. <laughs> um, we're really glad to have you all here today, and um, it actually turns out this was originally intended to be a question and answer session, but uh, we only had kind of two questions, one question and a request. And uh, the one question had to do very specifically with the Sound Devices Mix Pre, and we actually got it, I think, sorted out. So um, let me just give you some background on what that is as we, you know, kind of once we get past our um, the first part of our agenda. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at our agenda and see what we're going to talk about here today. First of all, um, for those that uh, are interested in the courses, we do have an upcoming course we're going to start working on here. Actually, two possible abilities, but the most likely one is a sound for live streaming with the ATEM Mini. And uh, we're going to dive into some of the details on how to set the ATEM Mini or the ATEM Mini Pro up for um, live streaming and uh, kind of to optimize your sound overall. So that's one thing we'll be working on in the next little bit here. And then there's another possibility too that I've actually had in the works for a long, long time, but it's just been very difficult to schedule. And that is a, um, a collaborative lighting um, course. And so specifically, we're going to look at talking head lighting, uh, mainly for interviews and talking head types of setups, which is what I do a whole lot of. And we're going to work with my friend Levi Whitney, who is a director of photography. Um, the challenge has been actually getting things scheduled, and he's actually surprisingly bit, bit, very busy actually at the moment, which is surprising to me. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that's a good thing, I guess, for him, but <laughs> it is putting a little bit of a damper on putting together a course on that. A um, couple other things in the news I wanted to cover really quickly. First of all, there is a new video put out by the Dolby Institute over on YouTube, uh, and I put a link in the description of the live stream here. It's called The Sound of Hamilton, and it's an interview with the sound designers and the mixers that worked on the theatrical release of Hamilton and also the, the Disney version that actually just started streaming here uh, back in early July. So definitely worth going to check out the interview and um, hear from the people that did the work there. There's some really interesting and I think kind of fascinating things about theatrical sound. Um, one of the things you'll notice is as the as the as you play that video at the start, they're going to show a bunch of scenes from the Disney. Actually, I'm not sure if it's the Disney version or if it's a theatrical, but you will notice microphones in various places. And in fact, you will notice microphones sticking out of the front of hair, <laughs> uh, just at the hairline. Um, so they do some really interesting things to capture sound and to reinforce sound in theater, which I think are really fascinating. Things that I think we could definitely learn um, and apply to video and film production as well. So really interesting um, Really interesting stuff, though. So, Mark, thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the happy birthday wishes. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of highlight is there's a new app. It's, it's it is iOS only, um, so it's not gonna it's not available on Android at least not yet. By a company called Acusonus. We've covered some of their plugins in the past, but they now have a app for iOS called Mavio. And what Mavio does is basically you can shoot a video on your phone, and then this is for those that are into shooting video on phone, and I think all of us do at some point. But I think more. Um, more importantly, a lot of us get questions about how they can make better audio on a phone when shooting video. And what this does is it actually does some post-processing. It automates a lot of it. You don't get a lot of control over what you, um, you know, can kind of in terms of the parameters, but a little bit. And um, there's some interesting things there. So if you ever do get those questions or if you yourself do shoot with your phone a lot, um, that could potentially be a helpful little app there. So just wanted to alert you to that. Now, also... Uh, Sound Devices is officially shipping their SL2, which is the slot um, accessory that goes with these the 8 series recorders, so the Scorpio 888 and 833. It allows you to insert two uh, receivers, uh, slot receivers, and it does this super slot standard, so you can actually get up to eight channels of audio through that, plus it has an additional, I believe, two AES inputs. So looks like a pretty interesting thing and probably something I'll be adding to my kit here in the next little bit. And then finally, um, if, <laughs> if any of you were interested um, for any pro level um, wireless systems, Audio Limited, it does have a sale going through the end of July where I think it's up to, I think it's $300 off a receiver and $200 off the transmitters for the Audio Limited A10 system. So that's available over at the, the typical suspects like the Gotham Sounds, True Audio Production Sound or Location Sound Corporation and so on. All right. 
Um, so let me take you to, yeah, let's go back. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the questions that were submitted. And the first question actually was from Stu, and Stu uh, was having some issues with his mix pre. He updated to the latest firmware, version 7. He did a shoot. He had set it up initially to um, record both a stereo mix and isolated channels, but he only got the stereo mix in the end. So uh, he had to, you know, he, he was wondering what, what could he do to fix that issue. And so, um, what we did is we ended up walking through a number of things. It turns out that the version seven firmware update is a little bit unusual from the standpoint that it actually has to run through twice. So if you are doing that update, make sure you run it through twice. Make sure you follow the documentation at the sound devices site very carefully, um, just so you don't run into that issue. And once he did that, it looks like that solved the problem. So, um, there's that. The second one was actually a request, and I'm curious how other people feel about this as well. Um, and I'll share how I feel about it. But Rob uh, K actually made a request to um, if if he could submit some photos and a link to his live stream and uh, some photos of his live stream setup, and have me critique it. Now, the first thought that came to my mind is that um, I don't. <laughs> I'm not an expert, so uh, I'm learning this as we go. And um, I think it's, uh, I, I'm not perfect at it yet. And I finally, uh, Emma's here helping us again for the second week in a row. So thank you to Emma to, for making, a, I think, what is going to be a, a smoother process and a smoother live stream for us. Um, but we still are learning lots of things. But if you're interested, I'm happy to provide my input. And I'm sure that those of uh, you in attendance will be happy to provide insights as well. And I think the idea here is just to, as a community, kind of, feed each other with ideas and, and help improve our process across the board. So that's one thing we'll be looking at. All right. If you do have questions for the live stream today, that is fantastic. We will definitely be taking live stream questions. If you could, uh, at the start, just put at Curtis Judd Audio. That'll make it easier for Emma to find them and put them up on screen so we can talk through those. So um, by all means, go ahead and share those in the chat if you'd like to talk about those. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch to our uh, overhead, and we're going to take a look at our mixer here. Now, I need to do one thing really quickly. I need to turn off another light. That's one of the not-so-ergonomic things about our setup. One second, please. <clears throat> All right. So there's a case for purchasing a DMX board, so I can actually do that from the desk here, or my producer can. <laughs> Um, so let's take a look at things here. I wanted to give you kind of a, an overview. Let me just kind of zoom out. This is the Allen & Heath SQ5 mixer. It's a digital mixer. And now you can see our messy setup, what it really looks like over here at this so-called studio. <laughs> um, also, thanks to, to Vincent and, and to, I think it's, is it IP or LP? I can't tell from the, um... From your name there for sure and i apologize all my pronunciation but thank you so much for the super chats there i appreciate that all right um let's take a look at the allen and heath sq5 so this is a digital mixer now why am i showing this on a sound for video session you don't generally use mixers like this when you're doing sound for film and that's true uh, but the reason i wanted to show it is that these concepts that you can learn from a mixer like this make you a much better um, mixer overall both for film and video and also for post-production. So, and what's interesting to me is that the these digital mixers now can do things uh, where it's kind of blurring the lines in a lot of ways. So you can see up here, for example, there is actually a USB port, and I've got a just a little USB thumb drive, a very small one in there. We can actually do a multi-track recording to that thumb drive here. So in a lot of ways, this almost becomes like a digital audio workstation, um, but without a computer. Or you can connect it to your computer and do multi-track recording that way as well. So you have lots of options. It also has a slot in the back where I can insert a Dante card. Um, it also supports what they call, Alan and Heath calls S-Link. Um, so what S-Link allows me to do is run a single RJ45 network cable between the mixer up to the stage where there's a stage box. And that stage box has, um, I think a, a lot of them that you can buy have like 16 or 24 inputs and some, um, some number of outputs as well. And so what that does is it makes it so you don't have to run a snake. But with Dante, you can do even more than that. With a Dante card, you can, with a network cable like that, you can route audio all over the place and do all sorts of very interesting things. So um, 
there there's that but then i also wanted to talk about some other things here um let's just do uh, kind of a quick tour here so the way this works um at a very fundamental level and this is for people that aren't familiar with mixing boards who have never operated one um, you have each of your channels here so each channel is represented as a vertical line here and each one has a channel it has a mute button um, it has a select button in this case and then once you select it uh, let's go ahead and just show you what happens here so i'm going to mute the phone I'm going to select the channel that we're working on right now. So once I select it, I actually get a readout, and we'll zoom in so you can see that a little better. Okay, so you can, um, you, this is where you basically can take care of all of your settings. So here, for example, I have the preamplifier. This is where I can actually, on the scribble strip, I can change the name of the channel. So if we zoom out just a little bit again. We're going to come, uh, we've got your question here. We'll come back to your question in just a minute. So this is the scribble strip. It's hard probably for you to see, um, but this gives you the name. You can you can give it a, each channel a custom name. So this is the SR314. That's the microphone I'm talking into right now. I do have another microphone set up. That's the Stellar X2 Vintage, which is on channel one. And so I can give a name to each of these. This is the phone channel. This is where we were playing the music at the start of the session. So that's one thing you can do. Let me just go ahead and zoom back in with my kind of hacky remote control camera. <laughs> um, so here's where we set the gain. We have a high pass filter, so I can bring that in and adjust the frequency. You can hear how that changes my voice pretty substantially as we move that back and forth. And so here, for example, I have it set to right around 50 Hertz, which is a pretty typical place I like to put a high pass filter just to manage any sort of low frequency rumble in the room or the space. Um, we also do have a gate that we could apply and let me go ahead and turn that on. Now you can hear when I turn that on and then I stop talking, it really silences things up. So we have all these different um, settings here for this. Of course, we have our attack, our hold, our release, our depth, which is how much it actually cuts. So I can actually make that a lot less obvious and maybe do something more sane like a maybe a minus 6 dB so when I stop talking it quiets down but not it's not quite as obvious and then of course we can adjust the threshold so that it kicks in earlier or later I'm going to go ahead and usually I would probably drop that down to usually more in the 30 something like 40 depends on the room of course and how much noise there is but there's that. I don't use gates a whole lot, to be honest. Now, I think where a gate can be useful is if you don't have an auto mix feature and you do have multiple microphones and, and several people talking in the same room, that's where a gate can become useful. Can be tricky to get them set up just right in terms of their threshold and all that, but um, they, can, they can make a difference and they can definitely clean up your mix some. All right, next over to the compressor. We do have the compressor set turned on. And in fact, um, what you can see here is here's my input level here on this meter. Here's my output level on this meter. And this one right here is my gain reduction. So if I laugh, for example, <laughs> you could see that uh, it was doing a substantial amount of gain reduction and that's represented on a kind of a rolling time basis right here, how much gain reduction it did. So you can see here where I'm just kind of, I've set the compressor just to kind of smooth things out just a little bit. We're not trying to go really crazy here and then we did apply a 12 db of gain of output gain or makeup gain in the end there and uh ratios at three to one so fairly mild we're not going too crazy but enough to again kind of even things out thresholds at minus 13 so again we're just barely tickling things not not pushing really hard on the compressor um attack and release uh attack is set right now to about eight milliseconds this is going to let some stuff through so but it also will end up sounding to my ear a little bit more natural so that's that's one thing to keep in mind often i would actually generally put my release somewhere in the 150 range depending on what you're you know what what you're doing here in other words making it this is how long it takes before it completely lets go compressing after you come back up above the uh the threshold there but somewhere between 100 and 150 is usually where I find myself. Okay, let's take a little pause here. I think we had a question and we have another um, super chat. Thanks, Alvaro. Really appreciate that. 
So we're going to head back to our question here. We had a question about the octavos. Um, I have the Octava matched pair connected to a Zoom F6 with a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K mic level. Okay, wait, keep that on there. <laughs> Let's uh, use some attenuator cable, but would appreciate your guidance as I'm still getting continuous hiss on the stream. Okay, so if you are coming in at line level, oh, mic level and an attenuator cable, Okay, the Zoom F6. Um, it's been a while since I've had my hands on a Zoom F6, and I'm not 100% clear on whether the output of the F6 is truly line level. Um, I think it is. I think it's consumer line level. Um, so I would go directly into the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K at line level um, without the attenuator cable, and that would be my first step. If, it's, if you're getting hiss there, um, I'm not sure that adding an attenuator cable and then switching the camera to mic level is going to help that. It's just going to essentially reduce the level and reamplify it in the camera. So that's not going to get around the issue there. But I, I, I guess I'm curious if if you go into the Zoom F from the Zoom F6 into the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera with uh, a line level setting with a standard cable, not an attenuator cable, but a regular old 3.5 millimeter stereo mini jack cable, that ideally should be the kind of the most direct route. And probably the one I would try the first. So hopefully that helps. And thanks for the for the question. If I misunderstood, definitely go ahead and um, send me and give us some additional information. We'll be glad to, to talk through that as well. Okay. All right. All right. So here's the next question um, from Peter. Do you transport the Allen and Heath to events? Where would it be used? Yeah. So this is this would be used for. Yes, for live, if you're doing uh, front of house or sound reinforcement, this is this is where you would use something like that. But again, you could use this also for a recording um, in a recording studio. And in fact, the main reason I have it is that, I, the main reason I purchased it, I should say, is that my wife does some live music. And um, there have been a few, a few shows where we, you know, where this could have come in handy. And so up until now, I have not used it, but um, it's here and ready to use if I do need to. I also was curious about potentially using something like this um, in a recording studio kind of setting. So yeah, so it's, it's actually fairly portable as far as mixing boards are concerned. I mean, it, it, with as many inputs as it has, it has 12 inputs, 12 physical inputs on the unit itself, but you can also get a breakout box um, or a stage box. It has even more inputs. I think it can handle up to 48 channels. So for the fact that it can handle that many channels, um, and actually let's switch to the overhead cam again. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit, give you a better sense here. Um, we do have multiple banks of, um, so as I switch between the banks, you can see the faders are all motorized. And um, so that's how I can actually control up to 48 channels at the same time. Um, so thanks for the question. Okay. Um, Vincent, uh, Peter, thank you for the... Uh, the birthday cake fund. <laughs> We're having, oh, by the way, we are having a, a cake today, right, Emma? Uh, it's brownies. Oh, sorry, brownies. Today it's brownies. Okay. Um, but I did also request, um, we can't, we could eat ice cream here, but we'll, we'll all pay the price. But we do uh, make homemade, uh, what we call ice cream with coconut cream. And I requested blueberry today. So uh, thank you for the, uh, <laughs> for the contribution there. Thanks also. Uh, Vincent, I have never tried Nashville hot chicken, but it sounds like with the contribution here, I'll need to give that a go. And then also, thanks so much, Rob. And also thanks, Rob, for your recommendation to do an evaluation of people's uh, live stream setups. We have actually, I don't think anyone had any objections. So um, Rob, if you'd like to send over some, some uh, photos and kick us off, we'll be glad to cover that next week and have the entire community here jump in and provide some input and see how things go. All right. Um, yes. Okay. So the next question is, what is the PAFL underneath the select button here? So that's your post after fade or listen. That's actually configurable. So you can do a post fade or listen, or you can do, uh, or sorry, a pre fade or listen or an after fade or listen. So it is configurable based on what you want to do. Um, so you have options there. So this is, this this mixing board is incredibly 
incredibly flexible. You, you, I am astonished at what it can do, and I haven't figured out everything um, in terms of its flexibility and configurability just yet. So definitely a learning experience for me still here. All right, let's go back to the overhead and let's take a, a closer look here. All right, uh, where were we? We were talking about the compressor here and I was adjusting the release. So yeah, somewhere between 100 and 150 milliseconds is typically where I'll do that. I think one thing that's also very helpful and I wanna kind of explore this a little bit more. So here's the screen where you have, um, you can adjust your high pass filter here as well. But this is also where you can do the EQ and I can actually, let me just zoom in so you can see that a little better with my amazing remote control camera, which is really just me reaching up and changing the zoom level. <laughs> Um, let's bring in the equalizer. And now we have, I believe, yes, we have four different four different parameters we can adjust here. So here I'm, for example, adjusting the bass, the low frequency. And you can definitely hear a difference there, right? <laughs> uh, crazy woolly um, is what I would call that. So we don't want to do too much of that. But here's where oftentimes you will solve problems. And this, and by solving problems, when you're doing front of house sound or live reinforcement, typically what you'll do is come in here and this will help you solve feedback issues. So what you can do, and typically the way I would approach it is I would go, let's go to the low mids and we're gonna go ahead and bump it up. We're gonna make it narrow. And then I'd sweep this back and forth. Now, watch what happens as I continue to talk and sweep this across the frequency range checking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now I probably went too far in terms of gain. I would come back down usually around, a lot of times if you're doing with spoken word, I usually go about nine just as a starting point and then sweep back and forth. But you could also use this for, if you are having feedback problems, you can find where you're getting that, that kind of outrageous resonance. And once you make it worse <laughs> during sound check, um, then you would you would cut that frequency like that. And then you could even widen it up some if you needed to do that as well. So let's talk about it in the context of dialogue because I think for us doing video, that's gonna be more relevant in post-production. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, what I would do typically is I would do gain of about 9 dB I would make it as narrow as possible, and then I could sweep this across, across the frequency range. And this is gonna help me find any sort of resonances. It turns out that the real-time analyzer that you're seeing here in the background can also potentially be helpful. And here, for example, on my voice, there usually tends to be a resonance somewhere right around 1K, and then there's another one right here around 2K oftentimes. So let me just kind of demonstrate here. So if I come to 1K and you can hear that, it starts to make this kind of weird whistly sound. Now obviously we're overemphasizing that a ton. So let's cut that by about four dB and then widen it up. Okay, so this is what it sounds like now on my voice. So let me go ahead and take that out. So I'm gonna turn it off. Now it's off and you can hear what I sound like and then I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back on and that's what it sounds like. It just gives it a slightly smoother sound and then let's go ahead and jump to the next one and do the same thing. So I'm gonna bump that up. About right around 9 dB, make it narrow. What I often find is there's another something here. <laughs> Can you hear that already? 2K, two kilohertz. Let's go ahead and keep sweeping. There might be some others up here as well. Checking one, two, three, four, five. I think the most obvious one is gonna be here right around two kilohertz on my voice. We'll pull that down again, right about 4 dB, widen that up. All right, so this is what it sounds like now with the EQ. And I've done two cuts, one at one kilohertz, one at two kilohertz. I turn it off and there's the difference in my voice now. So there's a, if I wanted a smoother sound, um, turning it back on now, this is a little bit smoother. It kind of takes some of that mid-range harshness out of my voice. So definitely, um, something worth looking at. So here we have a question. Can you demo the high pass filter again by increasing the Hertz value while you speak since it seems to be really obvious what it does and thus very illustrative. Let's do that. Okay, so I have my high pass filter. I've turned off the EQ for now and let's go ahead and talk. And as I'm talking, I'm gonna go ahead and increase the 
uh, setting here for the high pass filter and we can come all the way up to, in fact, let's go right here. We are up to two kilohertz. So that's what my voice sounds like at two kilohertz. I'm backing it off now again, backing it off. Now we're in the kind of the more traditional range here at, at uh, about 50 hertz. And so let me do that just one more time here. I'll go ahead and talk, talking, talking, talking while we increase the setting here on the high pass filter. We're now at two kilohertz. And now we're gonna drop that off again, pulling back, back, back until we're back around 50 hertz. And then I'll go ahead and turn it off entirely. There is no high pass filter at all. Here's the high pass filter at 50 hertz, which may or may not make a big difference. We don't have a super noisy room here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and increase it until we get up to two kilohertz. And you can see what that does to my voice. Now you also have a few options here in terms of the slope that you can use. Um, there's a 12 dB Butterworth, a 18 dB Butterworth, or a 24 dB Butterworth. So let me just show you what they look like. They just look, they're just steeper curves is essentially what they are. So it depends on how aggressive you want to be. So if you are definitely having a low frequency rumble issue and you really want to kind of attack that without cutting into the dialogue too much, you can use that. Now, what I have found, there is potentially a little bit of a cost there. It seems like that when you apply a fairly aggressive high pass filter like this, you start to run into, it. it you, get, you generally end up with a little bit less headroom. And what I mean by that is my, rec my what I've recognized or what I've found in my experience is that a lot of times when you do that, the um, if you look at the waveform, say for example, in a digital audio workstation, what ends up happening is the waveform, especially on men's voices, starts becoming very asymmetric. So um, the rare, you know, the 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 waveform above the center line is much larger in amplitude than the waveform below, or vice versa, and so you just don't generally have as much um, headroom. So that's just one thing to keep in mind when uh, we're talking about high pass filters. Okay, let's uh, let's go back to our EQ. I think we were finished there, but let's just double check here. Oh, another thing you can do with an EQ is you can attack sibilance. So we don't have a de-esser on this particular mixer. Um, there may be a plug-in. Actually, that's another thing. It can take plug-ins as well, but as far as defaults, we don't. And uh, as, it, as it happens, my voice does have some sibilance. And in fact, if we bump this up here, let's make it narrow. Let's, uh, I, I apologize in advance, so you might want to turn your volume down. I do have a fair bit of sibilance in my voice. She sells seashells by the seashore. And maybe you can help me identify where the worst of the sibilance is. <laughs> but it's usually between 5K and 10K. She sells seashells by the seashore. 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 So it's somewhere in this range here. And what I would probably do is maybe just bump it down a little bit and you can widen it up a fair bit and maybe split the difference. So that might be a little too much, but she sells seashells by the seashore. It's hard for me to tell in my own voice right here, but there's what you could potentially do as far as DSing is concerned. Now it's not as it's not as dynamic as a as a proper DSer, um, but it does it does it can help you manage things if things are really kind of getting crazy as far as sibilance is concerned. So there's a walk through that. All right, um, let's uh, take a look here. Setup. Um, oh yeah, there's another thing I want to do here. So typically out of the box, um, actually, let's take a pause here. We have a question. All right, uh, glad you're talking about digital mixers. I've been looking at the, Q um, is that the QSC Touch Mix 16 Compact Digital Mixer as a portable mixer rather than MixPre 10T, for example. Thoughts and pros and cons of this route. Um, great question. I'm not familiar with the QSC the touch mix. So I can't speak specifically to that one, but I think there's definitely a time and a place for each. Um, if you've got to stay small and in a bag and move around a lot, then I think that's where the mix pre has a definite advantage. But if you're going to be at a table and, um, you know, I think that's where something like a digital mixer here can make a whole lot more sense where it's a lot easier to work with. You've got tools like this on a mix pre, you don't have an EQ, for example, you don't have a compressor, you've got a limiter. Um, but if you would like to have some of those types of features, 
then that's where I think a digital mixer is going to make a lot more sense. So that's my particular take on it. Now, it depends, again, on what types of things you're doing. Um, are you willing to schlep around a fair bit more gear? <laughs> this is a lot bigger than... Uh, than this, and this is in front of it, so you can see, I mean, the size of the screen is bigger than the mix pre itself, so <laughs> it's a big difference. Of course, it depends on how many inputs you need, um, if you need the flexibility in routing. Um, that's the thing is, too, you know, something like an 888 has routing that's probably about, you know, in the same, in the same league as in terms of uh, routability as something like this, but um, you do still have limitations. Again, it does have an EQ, but it doesn't have a compressor. Um, does not have a gate if you need something like that. Um, so those are kind of the some of the the things to consider. Um, obviously, too, if you've got a ton ton of inputs, there are different ways to approach that. Now, this is obviously one such option, but even Sound Devices makes their uh, recorders, their Dante recorders, which can record something like sixty four channels. So if you do need a massive number of input channels, there are other ways to do that. So if you're working on a smaller cart, that's where it can make sense. Now, to put something like this on a, on a sound cart would be possible, but it'd be a pretty big cart. So, um, but there are a lot of, there are some production sound mixers that use, uh, Yamaha makes a digital mixer. I've forgotten the name of it, um, but they, a lot of people are using those on carts. Uh, or at least some people. It's not it's not unheard of. And in fact, I've seen those particular mixers, the Yamaha mixers for sale at uh, the Gotham Sounds, the True Audios, and, and other places like that. So definitely have their place. Just depends on what kind of productions you're working on. But yeah, I think it can definitely make sense. The QSC Touch Mix 16, I'm, I'm guessing at this. Um, but I'm guessing that that uses... Does that actually have like a a physical set of faders like this does here. Again, if I use my amazing automatic zoom cable here, and if you could uh, pop the pop that off, the comment, there we go. Um, I don't know if it has physical faders or if it uses something like an iPad as an interface. That's going to be a big difference too. There's a big difference between something like this, where you have full, you know, tactile, physical control. This is way smoother than any iPad fader I've ever used. And uh, there are definitely... You know, people that are really hardcore about making adjustments a lot during a production are definitely going to prefer something that has a tactile mixer uh, faders. And in fact, um, there's some debate about whether, you know, motorized faders are smooth enough <laughs> for those that are really, you know, very skilled at uh, doing live mixing. Um, some of them don't even like motorized faders because they don't feel like they're smooth enough. These are going to be smooth enough for me personally, but that's a consideration as well. So thanks for that question. That's a good one. All right. Have you taken a look at the Maxi line of digital mixers? If so, what are your thoughts? No, I have not. Um, I actually have a Maxi analog limiter, just one of the VLZ4 series, which are great mixers as well. Um, but I haven't looked at the Mackies yet. Um, Mackie, I, I was actually, I like Mackie mixers from the standpoint, at least on the analog end. They're just super durable, super reliable. Um, they sound good, so a lot of things to like about them. And then, of course, Daniel mentions that the Mackie line of uh, mixers have physical faders, so yeah, that, that again can make a big difference. All right. All right, let's keep going here. There was one other thing that I wanted to do on my mixer here. You can see here, oh, let's zoom in a little bit. This is a case also for a, um, is it called a PTZ camera, I think, where you remotely control it? That actually might be. Um, but right here on the uh, scribble strip, this is the phone channel. I actually put this here. It actually is normally over here on bank number three. Now, if I have a simple setup here, I've just got two microphones, Stellar X2 Vintage and the SR314, which I've been talking through. Actually, let's switch, by the way. This microphone is not super close to me, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of a... Let's switch. Okay, now I'm over on the Stellar X2, just so you can hear what that sounds like. And let's change over. Let's do a little work on that as well. I'm not really... It's a very different sound. <laughs> um, let's come into the low mids. Oh, whoops. Hi. 
bump that low mids gain it up narrow it up hear that there's a resonance there checking checking one two pull that down that's partly room and partly my voice partly the microphone so there, there's a lot going on there Okay, checking, checking, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's a little funkiness there, as again, there often is with my voice. Widen that up. Okay, so here's before on the Stellar X2 Vintage, and here's after on the Stellar X2 Vintage. Probably a bit of a difference there. Let's go to our high frequencies. Boost that up, just get some nice uh, sizzle there. All right, she sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells. Oof, oof, sorry about that. She sells seashells. That's going to mellow it out some. So that's probably what I would do. Very similar, you'll notice, to the SR314 in that case. So, okay, so now I'm talking on the Vintage X2. We can come over to our meters, check and see where our levels are. They're looking pretty healthy. Back into processing. Let's take a look at the compressor. There's our compressor. Um, you also get a chance to, to set it either. Let me, oh yeah, we're in close enough. You can do it, uh, the detection circuit can be RMS, root mean square, which is sort of taking a look at the average and peak, which is much more sample oriented. So it's gonna look at individual samples. So they kind of react a little bit differently. RMS kind of, to me, has a smoother sound. Um, and if you're not super hardcore, if you're not really trying to make sure that you chop off every, <laughs> every little uh, transient, then RMS can sound, a, I, I think, a little smoother. Um, so that's what we're using here. Our attack, again, is about 8 milliseconds, release about 100 milliseconds, 3 to 1 ratio, threshold minus 14. So we're not doing a lot of compression here. Um, we can go ahead and drop the, let's go ahead and drop the threshold so you can hear what that sounds like. So you can see now it's definitely compressing my voice pretty hard. I don't know if you can hear a difference there. Um, so that's probably way too hardcore. We probably want to back off there. Again, the idea here is I generally just want to manage the, I uh, just want to kind of keep it kind of even. And so we're going to put our threshold somewhere in there. All right. So there's the second channel. So one of the things, let's go back to this. So I wanted to bring in this, I wanted to move the phone stereo channel over here onto the same scene, or the same, sorry, same bank of faders, so that it was a little bit easier. And let me pop out here. All right, um, let's let's pop out here. So I, I wanted to have it on the same bank here, just so it was a little easier, so I didn't have to go kind of switch over here, adjust the phone, switch over here. Because one of those transitions, if you're using, for example, a phone to play music at the intro, you want to do a pretty smooth transition. You want to be able to kind of fade out, mute it, unmute the, you know, kind of the, the dialogue voice and then and be able to continue on the program with that. So I wanted to move this over. So the way I had to do that is in a digital mixer here, you can actually come over here in the config and I can actually gang inputs five and six into a stereo, a single stereo channel here. So that's one way to do it. And so in addition to that, I come back over here and choose select this channel. You can see if I come over here, here's where I can choose uh, where this input is coming from. So I could choose local socket in this case, and then I changed it to stereo three, which, ha oh, you're not seeing this because I'm too far out. Stereo three, it just so happens is right over here. It's a 3.5 millimeter input for specifically for bringing in phones and iPods and things of that nature right here. So. Definitely some cool things there. Okay, a uh, question from Lloyd. And Lloyd, this is where I might need your help. Can you talk about how it handles layers and possibly a custom user layer? In other words, what control does it give you to customize fader layout? Ah, uh, so you can see over here, let's go ahead. And, and this is where I'm, I'm new to this. And actually, Lloyd, I think I'd like to have you come on and talk about this at some point. Um, but you have different layers. Um, yeah, so 
maybe I talked about, I don't know if I was talking about here just a minute ago what you were specifically speaking to, but that's one thing I do. I wanted to move the, for example, the the phone channel over here to layer A so that I had access to both of them without having to switch layers. So that's one thing you can definitely do. Um, but I think there's some more sophisticated things to do. There are also scenes. And um, scenes are a completely different thing too, where you basically have presets um, where you can have everything already set up for a different part of a show. And that's gonna be really helpful for musical acts um, where you have, for example, different songs that need different kind of setups um, and, and things of that nature. So if we come over here into scenes, let me just kind of zoom in again. You can actually create multiple scenes here. And we don't have any setup right now, but the idea here is again, basically you can preset everything, all of these input channels, where they're located on the different layers, um, and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of flexibility here. And this one can do, it looks like eight different, nope, not eight, not eight scenes, not 30 scenes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, this would be a pretty complex show here. And I have nothing but respect for the mixer that can do this, but we're still going at 130. I need uh, uh, you can do 300 scenes. So if you're ever feeling constrained and not having enough flexibility, I would say an Allen and Heath SQ5 ought to be able to <laughs> to accommodate almost anybody. Um, so yeah, so you can create up all those different scenes and then uh, of course can switch between them fairly quickly. So um, all right. So I don't know, Lloyd, if that covered uh, what you were asking about, but that's a great point. Um, I think that that's what simplifies matters. You, you know, you can make things a lot easier for yourself and you can then therefore produce a better mix. You can produce something that sounds better and is more pleasant to listen to. So definitely makes the, make things change. How does it appear on a DAW? How many inputs and outputs? So on a DAW, you can definitely, I know you can get at least 12 inputs with the way I have it configured presently, but I believe, again, it's a 48 channel mixer, if I remember correctly. So uh, you can access all of those. If you can bring physical inputs, add physical inputs to support that many inputs, it can stream those. Now, there are gonna be some limitations. It's a USB 2 connection. And so your computer is gonna be part of it, how latency free and how much bandwidth your um, you know, your USB 2 bus has on it. So that's gonna, that's somewhat dependent on your computer. I've never pushed it that far, obviously. I have done it as a, you know, probably a three channel input um, audio interface and that worked fine. One thing I did notice is that I had to buy a special USB cable to make this work with my computer uh, that had some ferrite cores on the cable to help eliminate some buzz and hum that I was picking up. Because again, you know, interestingly, they were connected to the same circuit. They're both being, the computer and this were being powered by the same circuit, but I did pick up some, a uh, little bit of interference there. So I did need to get a cable that had that ferrite core on it and that seemed to isolate it pretty nicely. So that's definitely something to, to, to consider. In terms of outputs, um, it has also 12 physical outputs. And I, I take that back actually, it has 12 XLR inputs, plus it has three sets of stereo inputs on quarter inch. Uh, the first two are on quarter inch, so there are four quarter inch inputs for two stereo channels plus a 3.5 millimeter input um, up here for the phone on a 3.5 millimeter um, stereo mini jack. So that's what you can do with it. Um, it's more than I'm ever gonna need. There actually is also an SQ6 and an SQ7 model which has more physical controls and they're much wider and probably more difficult to transport, but um, also give you a little bit more flexibility for big installation or big shows. All right. Let's see here. Any other questions we have? Nothing on, uh, nothing immediately. Okay, well, let's switch back to the main cam here. Let's just talk for a few minutes. Um, I don't know what this looks like now because we turned our other light off. <laughs> give me just a second here. This is a definition of not very ergonomic. Um, one second. Okay, this is a case where we're constrained by space. So 
we're still working on our best uh, setup here. Um, incidentally, a little update on my impressions on the Bear Dynamic DT880s, or 770s, excuse me, the closed back version here. I've had these, uh, we were just talking about this before the show. I've had them, I think, 12 years, and the ear cups are coming apart here. You can actually kind of see it there. So it looks like it's time to upgrade those <laughs> or replace those. Um, but otherwise, they've been fantastic headphones. Um, I need the, uh, Lloyd suggests, go ahead and put Lloyd's comment up there. <laughs> um, I need the clapper for my light. That is a great idea, Lloyd. Um, the only problem is it probably, you know, it's going to test our limiters and compressors a little bit if I do some clapping to turn the light on and off, but clever idea to avoid buying a DMX uh, controller. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lloyd also says, uh, sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot. It looks like cross-patching is possible, and that's pretty powerful as well. Yes, cross-patching is possible. And in fact, let's switch back to the overhead. You're already on it. Good job. I did, uh, I did turn the light on. I apologize for getting that glare now. Uh, what I can do is move that. All right. Um, yes, it does. I believe here you've got a lot of patching capability. So here are our outputs. Here's our Here are our inputs. You can see here, for example, five and six. Um, for reasons I don't understand, it's, I don't understand this matrix in 100%, but it wasn't showing the stereo in, but, um, in any case, yeah, there's, there's patching capability. I think cross patching is, I think that's what you're referring to here. And I think that's what I did here. So terminology, a little bit new to me. So, okay. So there's a, just a kind of a quick look. Um, I think it's good news. Nobody had questions or very few questions. Again, Rob, if you're still here, I would love to um, have you submit your stuff for next week if you're if you if it's if it's possible. Love to kind of take a look at that and see where we can get with that. And hopefully that's useful for people. I guess uh, let's take a poll. Are you interested in learning about you know in kind of taking a critique of people's live stream audio setup? We'll, we'll focus on the audio. We can look at all of it, of course, but. I think the audio will be the number one thing that we'll look at there. So let's, uh, if you if you can, go ahead and shoot that in and it'd be great to, to take a look at that. You're probably hearing my mouse here. I'm getting, doing some control things here. We have some, uh, there's an ergonomic uh, thing here where I've got my mouse right here. And in fact, if you switch to the overhead camera, let's go wide again on this. Look at this crazy setup. Um, to get the camera in, which is on a sentry stand on a boom arm, um, I have to kind of sit and be careful not to bump it, which is what it looks like when I bump it. Horrible. Um, and then I've got <laughs> I've got the phone tucked down here for our intro and outro music. I had to turn the keyboard sideways. Over here is the mouse and the mouse pad, and this mouse pad is attached to the desk, and it makes all sorts of racket. You can hear that, so we definitely have some things that we can improve on on our live stream as well, Rob. So we'll we'll take it kind of easy on you. Okay, question here: Do you have time code issues when you use Mix Pre 3.2 and the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K? My time code is always off by one to three frames. I tried different setup, but always with the same results. Um, good question. So I have I can say this: I did some testing with it when I did my uh, Pocket 4K review quite some time ago, whenever the Pocket 4K came out. That was almost approaching two years ago, I guess about a year and a half ago. Um, in that case, it, it worked nicely. I didn't have any issues. I think it was within a frame. It wasn't perfect, but it was within a frame. I think it depends on how you jam them together. Um, one thing that I think uh, that Blackmagic did that wasn't 100% I thought was a little disingenuous. And in their marketing, they said that the input, you could jam sync the camera and then you're good to go. And what, what jam syncing refers to is you, you plug in a time code generator to the camera. The camera picks up the time code and starts counting from there. You unplug the time code generator and you don't have it attached to the camera anymore. In that situation, it drifts quickly because you don't have an in, internal temperature compensated crystal oscillator in the camera. You just have a regular real-time clock. 
and it does drift. And I think that the problem with that is if you do jam sync it like that, within 30 minutes or so, you're already drifting. So, um, and even potentially within a few, just even a few seconds, you could be off by some amount there. So that's one thing that I would be careful with. But in my initial test, when I left the time code generator, I was using a tentacle sync key attached to the black magic. I didn't have any problems. It was within a frame, I would say. So that was my particular experience. All right. <clears throat> Question on the sound devices. Can you back up the presets on a mix pre to my Mac and then restore if need be? Um, sort of. What you can do is you can set a preset and save it to the SD card and then make a copy of that file on your Mac so you have a backup of it. Um, I don't know if you're referring to using the mix pre as an audio interface and saving a preset that way. I don't know of a way to do that. Um, you could do that in your DAW, for example, your digital audio workstation app. But um, as far as presets within the mix pre itself, you could save that to the SD card and then take the SD card out, plug it into your computer, make a copy of that file, and then you always have a backup of that. So you can always do that as well. So good question. Thanks for that one. Um, just follow up to my earlier question. I changed the setting to line level going out from the Zoom F6 with a regular 3.5 millimeter, still getting hiss if the fader is set to more than 30 plus and using stereo. Okay, um, what I would try then, let's get some comments from those viewing today. So if any of you have ideas on how to address that, let's try one other thing. I would also try a, uh, there are a variety of these different line isolators available on Amazon. This one's made by a company called Aukey, A-U-K-E-Y. Um, it's a transformer isolator. And I can put the link to that in the show notes afterwards, but uh, that's something you could potentially try as well. Um, different cables is, you know, kind of a standard set of things to try. You might try different cables as well. Um, but let's get some other other suggestions down there too, if anyone else has other things that you would try as well. Okay, let's go to our next question here. Next up, what is your opinion on the Deity VLOV Micro? Choosing between this and the Countryman B6. Uh, good news, I actually just did a review of that fairly recently, um, and that was over on my main channel. So if you just do a search for Curtis Judd V.LOV, and you'll find that video. We actually have audio samples of the B6 and the VLOV Micro and the VLOV Pro and a DPA 4160. So you have a few different samples there you can hear on some actual voices. Um, I think the Countryman B6 and the VLOV Micro are pretty similar. I think the Countryman is a little bassier than the VLOV Micro, but I felt like both of them were pretty, you were picking up all the frequencies to some extent, and so you could EQ them pretty nicely. Uh, so that would be that'd be kind of my thought on that. I think the VLOV Micro, the concern I have about the VLOV Micro versus the Countryman, the Countryman is is well built. Um, I have had mine for a couple of years now, no problems whatsoever. Probably used them on ten or fifteen, you know, productions plus my own use, and it's held up pretty nicely. The VLOV, um, both the the Micro and the Pro, um, I think time will tell how durable they are. That's the main concern I had about them. So it's saving money, but I'm not sure if they're quite as durable. And, and to be honest, if you're going to be using them on a regular basis for especially paid gigs, uh, what I find is that the having durability on your lavalier is a big deal. <laughs> I think that's honestly, that's part of the reason why the Sankin Cost 11D is pretty popular. That's a pretty beefy cable. Like it's not easy to hide because it is so beefy. Um, that's where I think, uh, you know, that's a consideration as well. So that's one thing I would take into account. I think the VLOV Micro is actually pretty good. I was pretty impressed with it. I think for its price, you're getting a fair deal. I think, um, I think it's going to be better for people that are shooting not all the time. Because <laughs> again, I think in terms of durability, it may run into issues before something like a Countryman would and certainly before a Sankin would. So those are some thoughts there. Can I use a VXLR plus adapter with a DPA 4066? I would think yes, 
Um, I assume that your DPA 4066 is wired for Sennheiser wireless, the 3.5 millimeter locking. And if so, then yeah, it should, it should work fine. So, okay. All right. We are, um, so I need to wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. I want to say, first of all, thank you to everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for coming on my birthday. That I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate all the well wishes. Thanks for uh, coming and being part of the this little community here for helping with the, you know, with the conversation, for contributing, for providing insights. Um, there's no way that one person can can do all of that, and certainly not me, um, because I'm, you know, I have a small brain. So <laughs> having your brains helps a lot. Um, so definitely thanks for joining here. Uh, we will be back with you next week. Get out there in the meantime and make some great sound, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you.